All right, is this working? I guess it's time to start. Uh, start by introducing myself. I'm Bob Kokora. Uh, I work for the Neural Networks Group at Cisco, where we focus mainly on uh, open source. Uh, I've been working on Neutron uh, since, I guess, what, the Folsom release uh, cycle, and have served as a core for, for some of that time. I've, uh, I was also the originator of the modular layer 2 plugin, and I'm here today to talk about ML2 port binding. There it works. Okay. So, um, in case anybody's not familiar with Neutron at all, uh, I'll quickly describe what a port is. A port is an access point to which uh, to a virtual network it can be used by various kinds of things to connect to that network. Uh, it's, a, it's an abstraction. Uh, so virtual machines, bare metal hosts, containers, uh, appliances providing network services, and, and many other things, you know, Linux namespaces that provide network services. Any of those might attach to ports. Um, what is port binding? In ML2, uh, it's a process by which the core plugin decides how a port will be physically connected to the network um, that that port belongs to. And uh, we'll, basically, the, the goal of this presentation is to, to give kind of a, an understanding of how that works, why that needs to be something somewhat complex and something that can, can be uh, you know, a failure mode of, of, of uh, Neutron, um, and how to, I'll give a little bit of uh, tips on how to troubleshoot issues that you might have with port binding and, and some thoughts on things uh, that might, uh, how this might evolve in the future. So why do I care? Um, you might be a user uh, or an operator. If, if port binding doesn't work, your, uh, your users are not happy. Um, so can I see a quick show of hands of people that sort of fall into that category? That's why they're here is because they, they need port binding to work and sometimes it doesn't. All right, good represented. Um, you might also be interested in port binding because you're a developer. You might be working on ML2 itself, working on mechanism drivers or other drivers for ML2, uh, or even on other services that integrate with Neutron. Uh, can I see a show of hands of people in that category? Great. Um, I might also just be curious. Uh, must be some of those here. Okay. And maybe you don't care, but you're here anyway. All right. I was going to say you can leave now, but uh, I won't. <laughs> okay. So um, quick overview of what ML2 is. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it is a, a core plugin for Neutron. Uh, it's modular. It was introduced in Havana. Um, it originally kind of was there to just unify and replace and eliminate duplicate code between the Open vSwitch and Linux Bridge plugins that were previously there uh, and use their, support their existing L2 agents, not requiring any changes to those. Um, so it, it ba basically became the reference implementation of the uh, Neutron server functionality and would, would work with those reference L2 agents. Um, it's composed of drivers. Those drivers were originally mostly in tree. The reference ones are still in tree, but uh, many vendors have out of tree drivers and, and different uh, open source projects and so forth that integrate with, with Neutron uh, have out of, out of tree um, drivers for ML2. Uh, these are loaded based on configuration information. Uh, one thing kind of unique about ML2 is that it supports multi-segment networks. Um, the, up through Mataka, the assumption is that those are bridged at L2, um, you know, so the broadcast domains, basically. That could be changing in, uh, in the Newton cycle, where we're adding bridge networks. But uh, you know, we'll have to look at how that impacts port binding. Um, one big goal of ML2 was to support heterogeneous deployments. Um, we'll talk a lot about that in, in a, some of the upcoming slides. Um, so there are drivers for very, for, for numerous uh, open source and proprietary controllers, switches, fabrics, and all kinds of things. So a quick overview of the ML2 architecture and the drivers. Uh, looking at the right side, you'll see there's the Neutron REST API, RPC handlers, database, and the core plugin that in this case happens to be ML2. So with ML2, uh, pretty much all the actual functionality is implemented as drivers. And there are three types of drivers. Extension drivers are, are there to extend, allow extension of uh, Neutron Core resources. 
that certainly can be abused, but it's also how things like our um, like quality of service and, and various other features within Neutron are, are implemented. So it's a, it's a good packaging device for that that lets you configure those things when you're going to use them and leave them out when you're not. Um, so we're not going to cover that too much. Type drivers are the ones that define basically uh, ways that ne virtual networks couldn't be encapsulated within Neutron. So those are kind of independent from the ways at which you access them. So the type drivers define things like VLANs or VXLAN managed by uh, Neutron agents and so forth, or potentially switch fabrics and things like that. Um, so type drivers maintain pools that, from which tenant networks are allocated. Um, they validate state when you create provider networks where you're trying to basically create a neutron network that corresponds to something that might already exist in your data center. Um, so they manage these pools for allocation of segmentation IDs. And uh, mechanism drivers are which, what we're going to talk about mostly today. Uh, they basically are responsible for configuring the physical infrastructure and uh, they're responsible for attaching ports to that physical infrastructure in order to give that port access to the network that it needs. So this is just a quick overview of the sort of basic uh, mechanism driver API. Um, all the different core resources in Neutron have sets of operations for, for create, update, and delete. And each of those is structured as pre-commit and post-commit uh, methods. So uh, I'm showing the ones for port here, but that's what we're most interested in. Um, all of these take as an argument a context object, so in this case a port context object. Um, that port context has currently dictionaries for the current and original values of all the attributes of that object. Um, so that allows the driver to kind of see the state of the object, or if in the case of an update, the, the previous state, so it can see what's changed. And in the case of the port, it also has access to the network that that port belongs to. All right, so one of the big goals for ML2 was to support heterogeneity. Um, there's various ways in which heterogeneity can, be, uh, can come from. Um, one is the type of devices that are connecting to the network. So you know, we all start out with VMs, bare metal ser servers came along, uh, containers are, are certainly of interest now. Um, various appliances that might provide network services, load balances, load balancers, firewalls, physical routers, you know, anything like that uh, that's plugging in. Um, these things may need, have different ways of connecting. Um, even for VMs, you can have a variety of different hypervisors and L2 agents that, that may or may not be required with those hypervisors. Uh, so like OpenV Open Switch and Linux Bridge uh, have their own L2 agents that run under Linux nodes. Uh, if you're using Hyper-V, there's a similar L2 agent. Uh, things like VMware have been integrated with, with uh, ML2, um, you know, maybe not with an L2 agent running on the compute nodes. Um, so there's things work, there's, there's basically, you know, differences that need to be resolved here and, and the uh, mechanism drivers are, what are able to handle this. Um, there's also special capabilities that you might need, like SRIOV, you know, you might have a, a cloud where most of your compute nodes are, are normal, but some have a capability like SRIOV. Uh, so those, those can be supported through mechanism drivers. Um, you may have a mixture of network infrastructure. You might have different brands of switches. Um, you also may have situations where you don't have uniform connectivity throughout your data center. Certain clusters of compute nodes might be connected to certain physical networks and others not. Um, so all these things are what make port binding um, sort of a requirement. It's not just a, a statically coded, you know, we, we know everything, it's just we're connecting to the network. There's things that can be different in different parts of the network or depending on who's connecting. Uh, so, so basically when you're deploying Neutron, you can, with ML2, you can configure whatever combination of mechanism, dri mechanism drivers you need in order to support your, your environment. So it can be simple or it can be very complex. Um, port binding determines which mechanism drivers handle a port and as part of that, uh, the network infrastructure gets configured to uh, provide the connectivity that you need. And some of you are here because uh, port binding can fail. Sometimes it's not possible, sometimes something goes wrong. Um, one of the things here is that when you do have a heterogeneous environment, you need some way of 
making sure that it is possible to bind. You, know, you might ask for something that's just not possible. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that Nova uh, availability zones and host aggregates and things like that can be used to basically target your VM at the environment you need. You know, if you need SRIOV, those are the mechanisms available to, uh, as a client, specify that that's where you want your VM to run. If you basically have, have or I'll get into this a little bit later, but if you're asking for SRIOV and it's not running on a host that has that available, it's not going to work. So um, anyway. So this is sort of a black box view of ML2's port binding. Um, there's inputs and there's outputs. Um, the inputs basically are the uh, attributes of the port, and there's some of those are binding specific. We'll look at that in a bit. But there's uh, an extension in Neutron that's been part of the core for quite a while that uh, defines binding host ID, profile, and VNIC type. Those are all inputs to port binding. If any of those change on a port, it basically invalidates any existing binding and uh, Binding needs to be uh, redone for that port. Um, there's also the, the, the network that that port belongs to is made up of one or more segments. Each of those segments is defined by uh, network type, physical network, and segmentation ID fields. Depending on the type, some of those may apply or may not apply. And uh, there's also the, the actual topology of the data center and what's connected to what. You know, the host that I'm trying to bind a port on or the device I'm trying to bind it for, what's it connected to. That kind of information can be an input to port binding. Uh, the outputs from port binding are, there's again some uh, port bindings attributes, uh, VIF type and VIF details. Those are things that are determined by the port binding. And, and in the case of virtual machines, Nova uses those to plug the port. We'll see how that works shortly. Uh, the binding can be made up of levels. We'll get into hierarchical port bindings in a bit. Uh, but those levels each have a, a driver that was responsible for that level and the segment that was bound at that level. So that's, that's output here. It's not necessarily visible through the API right now. That's something we will look at in the future. Uh, there's also, as a side effect of the port binding, configuration of the network infrastructure uh, to give you the connectivity that you need. Quick overview of the history of, of port binding in Neutron. Um, back in, uh, I guess it was Folsom or so when, when uh, Neutron, or at the time Quantum, was, was introduced. Uh, basically, there was configuration in, in Quantum that determined you know, which core plugin you're using. And on the compute nodes, you'd need to run an L2 agent that corresponded to that plugin. And in Nova, on that compute node, you need to configure the right VIF driver that, that worked. And if you got that all right, it worked fine. It was simple. Um, then, uh, I guess this is even before ML2 came along. Uh, in Grizzly, a port bindings extension was added. So we saw those binding attributes. The first of those appeared in this port bindings extension. Uh, that was during Grizzly. And uh, basically allowed, instead of hard coding information into Nova's config, this let the binding VIF type from, coming from Neutron tell Nova which, uh, you know, how the VIF would be plugged. So it turned into a, a generic VIF driver that would, would pay attention to that and do what was needed, whether it was open vSwitch or Linux Bridge or something else. Uh, so ML2 came along in Havana, and uh, it had a, a sort of basic port binding mechanism right from the start, and the mechanism drivers that were configured would return a value for, for binding VIF type that would then you know, get, get sent over to Nova, and uh, things would work, and uh, different mechanism drivers could result in Nova plugging ports differently. So we'll see how that works. Icehouse, things evolved a little bit further. Um, SROV was being support for SROV was being added to Neutron and to Nova, and uh, we needed to pass some additional information, so VIF details was added. Uh, so that let the mechanism driver that binds the port in Neutron pass kind of whatever's needed to, to Nova. That, in the case of SROV, is used to uh, basically configure the, the, the physical NIC hardware there to attach to the right VLAN and things like that. Um, in Juno, distributed ports were added for DVR. Uh, so that uh, affected port binding. We'll talk about that briefly uh, in an upcoming slide. Kilo uh, is where hierarchical port binding came along, and that was basically um, allowing scalability when using VLANs way beyond the, the 4K limits that you would have with VLANs on a single physical network. So we'll see that in a little more detail. Um, so this uh, next slide uh, kind of gives an overview of how port binding fits into the overall interaction between Nova and Neutron. Uh, 
Um, on the left, we see a controller node. On the right, a compute node. On the controller node, we see the Nova set of servers. You know, there's uh, the Nova API and the uh, you know, various other servers that make up Nova. Um, and we see the Neutron server. And on the, on the right side, there's a compute node, where in this case, we have Nova Compute and some Neutron L2 agent. Doesn't really matter what it, what, what it is, but it's kind of managing some sort of bridge or vSwitch or whatever. Um, so you see that. So when the compute node comes up, uh, the Neutron L2 agent comes up, and uh, Neutron has a uh, agents DB facility where agents of various sorts periodically do a report state RPC, and that basically indicates their health and uh, can also pass additional information about that agent from the agent to Neutron server. Uh, so in this case, that happens, and that agent's DB information is stored in, the, in, in Neutron's database that's available even if the server's replicated, uh, you know, all the agents are visible on all the Neutron servers and so forth. So along comes a client who's trying to boot a VM. That basically comes into Nova's REST API. And Nova, at that point, is going to uh, either create a port for that uh, VM, or maybe the port was passed in and you know, pre-created and passed into to Neutron, or passed into Nova. Um, and uh, at, at the point when Nova schedules that port to run on a particular compute node, it's going to update so that we have all the information we need to do the binding. So the, the binding host ID indicates what compute node the, the uh, port was scheduled on, or yeah, the uh, VM was scheduled on. So that update or, or create that sets all that information basically has the results of port binding. So port binding occurred kind of during that update or that create. The results come back, uh, the v VNIC, uh, excuse me, the uh, VIF type and VIF details are shown there on that arrow. So then Nova goes ahead and uh, tells its uh, Nova compute uh, server on the compute node to launch the VM. The VM plugs the VIF using the information that, uh, that got passed along, that, you know, the, the VIF type and VIF details and so forth. At some point there, the Neutron agent discovers that VIF has been plugged into the vSwitch and it does an RPC back to the Neutron server to get the details that it needs to be able to connect up uh, that VIF, and uh, the results come back to the Neutron agent, and it configures the vSwitch so that you have the connectivity. Um, so that's kind of a quick overview of where this fits in. Um, this is just a, we, we, we looked previously at the sort of basic RPC, basic uh, API for mechanism drivers where you saw the uh, create port, pre-commit, pre, -commit, pre create port, post commit, update ports, and so forth. So basically, port binding adds a little bit to that. It adds, uh, at the bottom you see there's a bind port method on the, on the mechanism drivers, and on the top, on that port context, um, there's some additional attributes. There's a host that shows you which host we're trying to bind on, and segments to bind is the set of network segments that are eligible to be, to be bound at that point in, in, in port binding. We'll see how that's used in a bit. Um, there's also a, a method called host agents that's provides the driver with easy access to the agent's DB to find out if, if agents are running on, on that host and uh, what type, you know, of, of the type that the driver's interested in and so forth and get the information about those. Uh, and then set binding, that's what's used actually to um, by that mechanism driver if, if it is able to bind to, to specify that it is the one that bound and specify the, uh, the segment that it bound to, the VIF type and VIF details. So a quick little diagram showing how that works. This isn't all animated or anything like that, but basically um, that report state we talked about keeps the, the information up to date. Um, so when the uh, Nova, Nova will basically enable the port binding by setting the host ID on the, on the port, um, ML2 will Yeah, a little mistake on there. Called mechanism drivers. Yeah, the, the mechanism driver corresponding to the agent uh, basically goes through what all, all the registered mechanism drivers. So the one that's corresponding to the agent uh, will see that, basically check to see that uh, its agent is running on the host that we tried to bind. It will uh, look at the segments of the network, see that it has connectivity to one of those. And uh, so the details there on the slide, you can look at that afterward. I don't want to take too much time on that. So port binding uh, 
has some considerations regarding concurrency and transactions. So the Neutron API operations almost always involve some sort of database transactions, you know, updates, creates, deletes, things like that. Um, and mechanism drivers are generally trying to interface to physical hardware, uh, talk to controllers, talk to switches, things like that. Um, those operations can take time. They can block the process from doing anything else. You don't want to do those inside the transaction. Uh, so when we saw the basic operations on uh, the basic API of, of like create, port, pre-commit, post-commit, those sorts of things, uh, the pre-commits are called inside transactions. The post-commits are called after that transaction is successfully uh, committed. And it's uh, pre-commits, you should generally not talk to any, any external systems. Uh, post-commits, you're welcome to do that. Um, so that all applies kind of to the CRUD operations, but when, when port binding occurs, there's also generally a need for the mechanism driver to communicate with something external. So we can't do that inside of a transaction. So basically what happens here is there's an op, uh, uh, one of the CRUD operations, create or, delete, create or update, is triggering binding. So that could be one that specifies the host ID as an update or creates it with a host ID or changes something that affects the binding. When we saw the, the list of uh, inputs to the black box port binding, there's things like VNIC type and so forth. If, if any of those are changed, we'll trigger rebinding. So basically what happens is the mechanism driver sees the port update that's triggering that rebinding. So it'll see the pre-commit for that as part of the transaction. It'll see the post-commit after it. Um, and in those, the, the new value for binding VIF type is unbound. So that's basically the transition from the whatever state it was in to the unbound state. Uh, if it's a create, it'll see those as, as create pre-commits and create post-commits. So then uh, the port binding occurs outside of any transaction. Uh, the core plugin will call bind port on all the registered mechanism drivers until one calls the set binding uh, to indicate that it was successful. Uh, it'll proceed, you know, until that happens, it's, it's done once that happens. If it doesn't happen, then, then we're in a, a situation where we, we're not able to bind and the client will end up seeing an exception or see, see, seeing that the, uh, actually not seeing an exception, but seeing that the uh, port is in an unbound, or in a binding failed state. Um, so after making those calls and successfully completing the binding process, uh, we need to commit the result. So that's a separate transaction. And that's actually seen as a separate port update from the point of view of the drivers. Um, so they'll see uh, the pre-commit call and the post-commit calls. And in those, they will see that now the binding VIF type is indicating some particular VIF type other than unbound or failed and uh, any other details that they, that they care about. We'll see some situations where that might be needed. All right. So there's since does that gap basically between those two transactions, other things can happen concurrently. You know, we, we may have multi-threaded servers or replicated servers. Um, so it's possible that, that other updates come in and change binding inputs uh, during that time, or some other thread may actually have also got an update that triggered rebinding for that same port and succeeded before this one and committed its results. So basically, there's a loop there. The, um, basically, there's validation that happens within that second transaction to see if the results are, all the inputs are still the same, that nobody else bound first. And you know, if that's all OK, then we go ahead and, and do the update to commit the results. If it's not OK, um, you know, we may have an existing binding now that we just used, so we don't have to do anything more. Or we may try again in a loop. So uh, just so you kind of have an idea what's going on, particularly if you're looking at log messages and so forth, you may see those loops. There's uh, limits on how many times those loops will iterate so that you know, in some real bad failure mode, you might see those, those limits being hit. Uh, all that should be logged uh, as errors if that ever occurs. All right. So just going to quickly walk through a couple of the different uh, cases where heterogeneity uh, impacts port binding. So one case would be where you have multiple network segments. Um, up through Mataka, like I said, these are assumed to be all bridged. Uh, but during Newton, there's work to add rooted networks where these segments might actually be different L2 domains and kind of routing happening between those. Um, for now, this is all assuming that it's uh, 
basically you're able to, if you want to connect to the network, you're able to connect to any of these segments. That may still hold true after the, the routing networks are implemented, but I'm not sure. Um, so like we said, the bind port iterates over, the bind port gets called on a particular mechanism driver. That mechanism driver iterates over the segments and as soon as it finds one that, that let's say it's a mechanism driver for an agent, if, uh, if it has connectivity, if, if the uh, agent's DB info for that agent says that it has a bridge mapping for that network, it'll connect. So some of those details were in that other slide that I kind of glossed over there. Um, but uh, just kind of give an overview here. Um, so if you have different types of L2 agents on different nodes, you might have you know, OpenV switch here and Linux bridge there, or you know, Hyper-V, you might have something else, you might have SRIOV in places, things like that. Well, we'll get to the SRIOV, but uh, with different types of uh, L2 agents, each has their own mechanism driver. Bind port gets called um, on them in the order in which they're configured until one succeeds. So in a typical environment where you had Linux bridge on one and OpenV switch on another, either one should be able to bind uh, depending on what, what, one, what agent's running on that node. That's pretty straightforward. SROV, um, in that case, what happens is the client's indicating that they need SROV by setting a special VNIC type value, binding VNIC type, that's one of the inputs to the, the binding black box. Um, so direct is one of the values that requires SROV. Um, so basically the SROV driver would be configured to run before other mechanism drivers. If it can bind, it will. If not, then um, maybe a normal L2 agent mechanism driver would bind. So that lets you support uh, situations where you have some SROV capable compute nodes and others that aren't on the same networks and in, the, in, the same, uh, in the same data center. All right, so um, talk a little bit about when you have top, top of rack switches and, and fabrics and things like that, um, kind of building on the scenarios I was talking about before. Um, if you start out, basically you can have a very simple top of rack switch or you know, switch that basically all your compute nodes are connected to, all VLANs are trunked everywhere, there's broadcast, you know, basically a lot of data going places it doesn't need to go. So kind of the first optimization of all that is say, we want to have a uh, a switch that only enables the VLANs that are needed on each port. Um, so basically that's done without really affecting port binding. So we can have a separate mechanism driver that uh, manages you know, the switches of the type that it knows about. Um, these switches are all sort of assumed to be connected to the same VLAN trunks. That, L2, that uh, a normal L2 agent mechanism driver would do the binding for that port to a VLAN. And then, like I said, when after the binding is committed, we have an update port. Those other mechanism drivers that, that, connect, that, that are managing the top of X switch may, uh, will see that a particular port has been bound and can basically look at whatever topology information they have to say that the host that that's bound on is connected to a certain port on a certain top of X switch and then enable that VLAN on that switch. So many of the vendor uh, mechanism drivers for ML2 do that, do that sort of thing right now. Um, so there's some, some topology information needed there to know what's connected to what, but it's, it's basically a, a very uh, useful, uh, useful optimization. Um, there's still a limit kind of that each, with VLANs, each physical network can only support 4K different tags. Um, one way to get beyond that in these kind of environments is to have multiple switches that each compute node's connected to. Each of those is a separate physical network. Each has its own uh, 4K space of, of VLAN tags, and, and it's easy to set up the VLAN type driver to, to allocate tenant networks across um, multiple physical networks like that, but that's certainly hardware intensive. Um, fabrics that um, t typically, you know, you might have top of rec switches that communicate with each other over VXLAN or, or something like that, managing kind of the uh, the uh, tunnel endpoints between those switches themselves. So this is different than the VXLAN support that's in the OpenV switch or Linux bridge uh, L2 agents right now. But basically, if these switches are, are, are implemented as a fabric like that, um, the sort of default way that you would map that to VLANs going to the hosts would be um, still as one global physical network with the 4K possible VLAN tags. Um, so that's where hierarchical port binding comes in. It's basically um, 
rather than have a global space of, of, of 4K VLAN tags, you can treat each switch, or even each switch port if you wanted to, um, if, if the switch is capable of that, as a separate physical network connecting some set of compute nodes to that, to, you know, to the infrastructure. And uh, in that case, that, uh, what, what happens is that top of rack switch's mechanism driver now will have to participate in binding. So it'll implement bind port. Um, it'll look at the, the static network segment, something representing the fabric that that, uh, that network is connecting to. You know, so that might be some VXLAN, VXLAN ID in there or something like that. Um, but what it does then is it either creates or finds an existing dynamic segment that's on this physical network that connects to the host that we want to bind on. And, um, basically allocates a VLAN tag on that or, or uses what's, what's already existing. Uh, you know, if a previous compute node is already bound on that same rack or whatever, you know, connected to the same switch. Um, so basically once that occurs, then it's, it makes a call. I'll show you that on the next thing, but there's a, uh, I probably should have put this slide after the other one. Um, continue binding where it actually specifies the new set of segments over which we could bind. Once that happens, then any normal mechanism driver uh, can bind to it. So that makes kind of this, these top of rack switch drivers that are supporting various ways of managing dynamic VLANs connecting to some fabric uh, work with anything that can bind to a normal VLAN. So OpenV switch Linux bridge or many other things uh, are able to connect. So this is one way of getting past that 4K limit. Uh, so basically as long as you don't have 4K networks in use in the same rack or with the same switch, um, you, can, you can scale beyond that. Um, so for, for hierarchical port binding, uh, we've basically extended port context with visibility to the binding levels. Um, so you see binding levels and original binding levels there. We still use set binding by the mechanism driver that finishes the binding, but if, if, a, if a mechanism driver partially binds, it calls continue binding on the context, passing in the, um, the segment that it's binding to, and then the set of segments for the next step of the binding. That's typically just one, but it could be more than one. Um, so there's also methods there, allocate and release dynamic segment that can be used to, to uh, create those segments, basically allocating them from pools. Um, and the same bind port applies there. So this is sort of a depth first kind of thing. What happens is uh, the top rack mechanism driver will look at the host that it's trying to bind for. That'll map to a physical network that's specific to that switch, I guess. It will out find or allocate a dynamic segment for that network on that, set things up so that you know the, 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 the virtual network and the fabric is exposed on that switchboard as that network. Uh, It'll then call continue binding, and then what happens is uh, ML2 will basically cycle through the drivers again, asking if anybody can bind with that information. Um, so it's very flexible. Um, there's also limits in there to prevent loops, you know, where something might keep uh, continuing binding on the same thing, you know, that kind of thing. Any, any, again, anything that you hit should result in errors logged and, and really shouldn't be uh, in a properly configured system, should not uh, run into that sort of thing. DVR port binding, so that's basically uh, when distributed virtual routers were added to Neutron. Um, these are implemented as Linux namespaces on each compute node, and uh, the interface where private networks are connected to the router end up needing to be bound on each compute node where basically VMs run that, uh, that use that private network that's connected to the router. Um, so rather than have a separate port on each router, that would kind of break the whole router model in Neutron. Um, they added a, a uh, capability to do distributed bindings. Um, so that happens independently for each. There's um, some RPCs that the router uses to tell ML2 the various hosts that, are, that we need bindings for. Everything pretty much works the way it does for, for normal non-distributed ports. Um, and ideally, it should be composable in that you can, 
you know, if you have top of rack mechanism drivers, you should be able to use those with DVR and so forth. I don't know how much testing's gone on in, in various combinations there, but uh, in theory, uh, combinations of that stuff should work. All right, um, how am I doing on time here? Five more minutes. All right, uh, a couple quick tips on troubleshooting issues with port binding. Uh, all of this basically requires admin privileges. Uh, so if you run Neutron uh, port show, look at the binding VIF type attribute. That'll be visible if you're running as admin. And uh, you know, if you see binding failed there or, or unbound, you don't have a binding for that port, that might be a, a clue to why you don't have connectivity expected, that sort of thing. Um, in the case of DVR ports, you'll see that as distributed, I think, uh, indicating that it's a distributed port, then it's really not all visible through the API. Um, so once you've done that, you also want to look at the binding host ID value. That should um, match where the VM is running. Um, you can use Neutron Network Show to get the, the, the segments that make up the network. Um, currently, only the static segments are shown, so if you are doing hierarchical port binding, uh, there's really no easy way now to see the dynamic segments that might be created for that network. Uh, we hope to fix that soon. Um, so if, assuming that you're running with an L2 agent on the host, you know, as, as the way that uh, ports are plugged on that host, the, the, the most useful thing to do is run Neutron Agents List. Uh, when you run that, you want to look for the L2 agent of the type you expect, make sure that it is showing up as alive and, and so forth on the, on the, uh, on the node where, where this port is being bound. Um, you want to make sure that the host, uh, host name basically of that agent and the port's binding host ID value are an exact match. You know, if one's fully qualified and the other isn't, they won't match. That kind of thing can happen in, in uh, real life. Um, then we use agent show to look at more details on the agent. Uh, if, uh, assuming you're using VLANs, you want to look at the bridge mappings that, that's part of the data that the uh, agent publishes to the, that agent's DB. Make sure that there's a mapping for the physical network of the segment that you're trying to connect to. Uh, if it's a tunnel, you want to make sure that tunnel types has uh, the proper, uh, you know, indicates that that L2 agent can support the, the network type of the segment that you'd be binding to. And if, you know, if you can't resolve that, then you're basically left uh, going through log files looking for, for errors. So I mean, this is definitely an area that can be improved over time. Um, so there's been a number of enhancements to port binding and, and so forth, the things that affect port binding that uh, have been discussed or underway. Uh, one, one idea is to generalize the DVR distributed port bindings and be able to use that for things like uh, DHCP uh, servers to run on each node or things like that. Just uh, could be useful also. There's some talk of using that for uh, live migration and actually allowing the, the port to be bound on the original host where the VM is, is running and the one that's migrating to at the same time to, to make all that work a little more smoothly. Um, when you have extensions like quality of service or things like that, uh, we, we really need ways to ensure that the port binding that you end up with is able to provide the semantics. Even, even like security groups is an extension. Um, there's cases like with bare metal where you don't have an L2 agent running to be able to enforce security groups. Uh, you'd like to make sure that if your port has security groups associated with it in that case, that it's not gonna be able to bind. Um, if, uh, but if you have a, let's say, a top of rack switch that's able to enforce the security groups as uh, ACLs, then maybe you do wanna bind even if, as long as those, uh, the security group rules can be enforced by that. Um, so that, that's an area where we, we certainly have work to do on ML2. Um, routed networks is doing one thing that's really helpful for debugging issues with, with port binding and so forth. It'll make segments into first class resources so that uh, a lot of that'll be easier to deal with. Um, it'll be also possible to add and remove segments, I think, um, after networks are created that you currently can't do. Um, and it's also probably gonna change port binding in some ways to be able to support routed networks. Um, there's work going on in versioning the binding VIF details and, and kind of basically making sure that the version of Nova you're running and the version of Neutron you're running agree on, on what information is needed there and uh, that kind of thing. Um, 
again, in trying to debug problems with port binding, making the results of the binding uh, visible via APIs would be very helpful. Uh, one of the reasons binding might fail in certain cases is because it's just not possible. You know, you're asking for SIOV, but it, your, your VM's landed on a, on a host that doesn't have that. Um, it would be nice to have Nova scheduling better integrated with kind of the network topology and what's, what's going to be possible to bind. Right now, you're kind of depending on host aggregates and things like that to, to manage that. And uh, um, I mentioned that sometimes the mechanism drivers will need information about topology. There's been uh, proposals to do a, a sort of generic uh, topology service that would be useful to those mechanism drivers as well as plenty of other uses. Um, so that's basically all, all I have here. Uh, be happy to take any questions. When on uh, binding stage, when something went wrong, uh, the port getting state with type binding failed. Why it's getting state binding failed instead of returning error on port creation? Because from operator point of view, it's very un uncomfortable to do to deal with this. When port cannot bind itself, why it's not return error on creation? Why it's uh, set okay. to state to bind failed? I guess that same, that same comment would apply to a port update that either requires or enables binding to occur. What, should it just fail? Um, I think the, the original thinking there was that that inability to bind may be sort of a transient thing. And, uh, the port might be created. It, it does kind of make sense. That's maybe something we should uh, consider. I, I, yes, uh, I got it. Uh, but for case when there is a misconfiguration on uh, L2 agent, basically yeah. wrong config file, wrong uh, physical uh, segment name, or something like that, when error can be detected on creation stage, why it's mm. uh, passing down through every stages? <laughs> I think that's a very good point. I think binding failures being returned as an error, whether it's from the create or from an update, probably would, would be useful because really being able to see the VIP detail or the VIP type and, and see that binding state you can only do as an admin, and this would be a way to, to allow non-admin clients to at least know that something's wrong. Uh, right now that basically is detected when, when the Nova VM doesn't see that the port transitions to the up state. Uh, so you do get some clue that something's wrong there and can track it down to the binding. But I, I think that's something that definitely did, uh, is worth looking into. Thanks. OK, thank you. Are there questions? All right. Um, contact info is there if you do have any. Oh, go ahead. To that. So in um, managers, there is like colon driver, which loops over enabled mechanism drivers. Uh, but when Actually, it does continue on failure because you need to try all of them, right? Uh, but when the particular mechanism driver returns an exception, it just try, accepts it, and returns like generic uh, ML2 mechanism driver. So there is no actually way to to get some information to the user why failure happened. Yeah, I mean that's the model here is that there can be more than one possible way to bind a port. So you need to try all the ways until you either succeed or run out of ways to try, and then declare it a failure. So it's, it's not like if, if, a, if a mechanism driver looks and sees that its agent's not running on that node, or that the agent running on that node doesn't have connectivity to the segments, it doesn't really mean that binding is failing. It's just meaning that mechanism driver can't bind, but another one might. So I mean, it would be very valuable to capture more detail of what mechanism drivers failed for what reasons, and then when binding fails at the end, maybe concatenating that together in some way that's, that's available through the, through the API. Right now, that information would typically be available through logs. All right, anything else? All right, thank you. <laughs>